This presentation is delivered by the Stanford Center for Professional Development. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our last People, Computer, and Design seminar for fall. Uh, I hope all of you have a great break coming up. Our, we're going to resume on January 11th with Yuri Leskovic, who's going to talk about his research here on social networks. And today we have Joe Fish K. I've known Joe Fish for a number of years. And my, my favorite anecdote about Joe Fish is he has the best research project name uh, that I've ever heard. And one of my goals in life is to be able to match that. And he was a PhD student at the MIT Media Lab, where he worked, among other things, on um, uh, kitchen research, kitchen technology. And the name for their Kitchen of the Future project was called, coming up with a smart kitchen, was called Counter Intelligence. I, I love it. Um, and since then, Joe Fish has done a whole bunch of things. Uh, he went on and actually got his PhD from uh, Cornell, uh, working with Phoebe Sangers there. And um, he's done a whole bunch of things, in, in including uh, ethnographic research on how families use technology. And he's done a great job of connecting the human side of things through longitudinal studies with the technical side of things. And uh, today, he's going to tell us about a bunch of his research on tablets. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you all for coming. Um, I realize coming to lectures at the end of the semester, for at least those of you that are students, is uh, you know, it can get more optional as things go on. So I'm delighted to have you here. Um, I'm also delighted to be back in this forum. I, I, someone asked about this, and I went to look back. So I last gave a talk this five years ago. So I figured if I come back every five years, that's kind of a nice ratio. I, I, I like this. So I want to talk about some work that um, I have done. And I want to particularly mention that this is work that I've done with Rachel Hinman. Um, and we'll, I'll talk more about the context in which this particular work happened. But, I wanted to, but she's sort of a co-author on this stuff. So this is me. Um, I am a senior research scientist at Yahoo in the human-computer interaction research group there. Um, as Scott mentioned, I have some degrees from hanging around various institutions on the East Coast-ish. Um, I've been teaching here slightly more recently with Terry. We've been teaching the Designing Liberation Technology class in the last year. I've coached it a couple of years before that. And I'm also a father of twins. And unfortunately, I couldn't find a really nice picture of me with the twins. But this is me with one of the twins, and the other one looks like that. So uh, you've seen Juan, you've seen, you, know, you know this one, right? Um, so what I want to talk about here, uh, this, is, this, is a, this is a talk that I want to divide into two parts, right? The first part is the stuff that I actually know about, right? And that's the findings um, that we found from this study of iPad users. Um, and then the second part is the implications of that study. And I think that's the bit that's a little bit more interesting. It's a little bit more provocative. And it's a little bit more on shaky ground, as in I'm sort of pulling stuff out with sort of very weak signals. So hopefully, we'll have some time afterwards for a discussion and for talking about this kind of stuff. Um, this page is legalese. This points out that this is work that I did when I was working at Nokia. This is not work that is based on work I've been doing at Yahoo. So what you see here does not reflect the opinion of Yahoo on any stuff, right? You don't need to run out and be like, oh, Yahoo's going to make a tablet tomorrow, because I didn't say that line, <laughs> right? Um, it is in work that I did with Rachel Hinman, who's now at Intel. Um, and it is based on published stuff from Nokia. So this isn't me sort of taking secrets away from Nokia. This is stuff that I published when I was there. So boring legally is over. Anyone recognize this guy? Yeah. So. Um, this is Mark Weiser. He, um, it is Weiser, right? I, I have this, you know how you have these paranoid things that I always think that it might be Weiser? And, I, and I've known this, but I still get, anyway. So Mark was talking about three particular things. Um, one in his ubiquitous computing stuff. And he was talking about computing at three scales. He was talking about computing at the inch scale, at the foot scale, and at the yard scale. And the, uh, back then, they had to go and build devices that would work to function to do computing at the inch scale and the foot scale and the yard scale. So they did the park tab and the park pad and the live board. And all of these were devices for exploring these different scales of computing. And one of the things that I think is interesting is to take a step back and, you know, particularly if you go back and have a look at the Scientific American article on this, um, we've now got a lot of this inch, foot, and yard scale, except that the inch scale is happening at the phone 
and the yard scale is happening, and the foot scale is happening at the tablet, is, is the tablet, and we're seeing big TVs taking up the space of the yard scale. And that's a sort of interesting thing to look at how that's worked out and how that's played out. And within that context, I want to talk about the foot scale. I want to talk about that, how, it's, how the tablet has played out. So the field study that this is based on was done about 18 months ago. Um, and what we did was we wanted to find people using iPads in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, this is very much a convenient sample, right? This wasn't us trying to get a sort of representative sample of anything. Um, we wanted to get diversity. We wanted to get people that were diverse in age, diverse in, in occupations. We didn't want, just want to get nerds. Um, and then we would go to their homes and we'd hang out with them and we'd spend a whole bunch of time um, talking to them and asking questions. And we'd do things like get tours of their homes. We, and we'd say, well, tell us about your routine. And we'd sort of walk around their room like, well, I, I wake up in the morning and, I, and, I, and before I get out of bed, I grab my tablet and I check my email. So we'd go up to their room and sort of look at where they, where they kept their tablet and things like that. So we got, within the boundaries of an interview study, a pretty rich story about what, what was going on. Um, we, wanted, we then did some analysis on this, and there are many ways in which we did this analysis. Um, we did lots of watching the videos. Again, we took notes in all manners, all different ways. We did a lot of affinity analysis and clustering and things like that. Um, and I also want to point out that Rachel and I are pretty good at making sense of this data. So I think we did less formal work than some people do, like we didn't put stuff into Atlas TI or something like that. But I think the results are, are reasonably um, solid. So let's talk about what we found out of this research. One of the things we found was that people bought it for the sheer hell of it. People bought iPads because they wanted to buy iPads. They didn't buy iPads because they had a problem that they were trying to solve, right? Um, it was the, sort of this shiny, beautiful object, um, and people really liked them, right? People sort of took great joy, and they are gorgeous objects. I mean, they're so pretty. Um, at the same time, people bought it, and then they were like, well, I'm not quite sure what I'm going to do with it, right? Um, and we found people like, like, like Indrani here said, well, I got an iPad, and I was really excited by it about, uh, for the first month, and I haven't opened it for the last two months. I'm like, okay, that's kind of interesting, because this wasn't a huge sample. It wasn't like we, we sort of went digging around trying to find everybody who might possibly have any experience. And there were a couple of other people who said, yeah, well, we haven't really used it this week or something. It would be under magazines, things like that. Um, and people, uh, this guy Daniel was like, well, I, I've got it, but 19% I, I, of the time I go back to my laptop. And this was interesting, because this wasn't the story we were hearing sort of in the popular press, where it was like, oh, tablets are going to take over everything. It's the future. Um, one of the other things that we found was this interesting thing which tablets didn't, weren't quite so individualized as of a lot of what we had seen with laptops. Laptops had a clear owner, like this is my laptop. Occasionally someone might use someone else's if you're, you're in the kitchen and it's there and you need to look up something, but laptops seem to have this much stronger sense of ownership um, uh, than, the, uh, than tablets did. At the same time, there were some interesting things like Tablets are not very well designed for multiple users. There is, there's not a very good way, for example, to have even basic email security. Um, at many corporations, you can check your email, uh, you know, you'll have an exchange email client or something, right? So it's great, because on, on my wife's iPad, I could install, uh, I could have my Nokia email, and I could read it on the iPad. Problem was that Nokia said, well, if you want to read any device you, you read your email, has got to have um, a five-digit PIN number. So, OK, so the five-digit PIN number. Problem is, then my wife needs to know the five-digit PIN number to use her iPad. And once, we're, once anyone's using it, or if someone wants to borrow a, a web browser or something, once they're using it, there's no further authentication. Like, OK, that's kind of a problem, right? Thinking about the right ways to do this. So we'll talk a bit more about that later. One of the other things we found that was a quite fundamental difference, really, um, was about the difference, different kinds of ways that people's bodies were arranged when they were using these tablets. People use tablets, people use laptops on the couch, right? Everybody knows you, you sit on the couch, and you're watching TV, you've got your laptop in front of you, and that's great. But we saw, the extent that we saw this with tablets was far more than anything I had seen elsewhere. The fact that people really were lying in bed reading them. And one of the ways that, one of the things that fascinated me was that people would not only lie in bed 
and watch movies on their tablet, but they would do it when they had sort of a big impressive stereo system, right? You know, they had a 48 inch TV with black and bows and quadra surround, and yet they'll go and watch their movie in bed cuddled up. And there's something really interesting about that. Um, this was, as I said, about 18 months ago um, that most of this research was done. And one of the things that most of this field study was done, sorry. Um, there was a lot of question about what the role of the 3G iPads, right? So whether you, basically whether you had a Wi-Fi iPad or whether you didn't. Um, and we found that, that there was some effects, right? We found that, that, for example, there were people, if you had, if you had the one with the, with, the, um, with the SIM in it, you were more likely to use it out of the house. Like that was a pretty, that was a pretty strong result. At the same time, there were some interesting edge cases. So I think this quote down here from Angela. Um, Angela lives in Silicon Valley, down in Mountain View. Um, she's married to someone who works at Cisco. Uh, they've got three kids, nice family. Um, and she sa said, well, I've tried making a grocery list on the iPad because that seemed like a reasonable thing to do. Um, and then she got, to the, she got to Safeway and sort of got the iPad out and she felt horrible. She was like, oh my God, this is really embarrassing. Like walking around Safeway with this, with this iPad grocery list. And I thought that was interesting, right? When people tell you that story, when people talk about, and, and partly it's sort of, you know, at the time it was quite an expensive object. It's still quite an expensive object. Um, it was, but she, she felt this phrase, shame, great shame and embarrassment. Um, and when people say things like that they felt great shame and embarrassment using a technology, that's, that's really interesting, right? That's one of those things where you look up and you say, well, there's something going on here that's, people don't talk about using their technologies with great shame and embarrassment a lot. So I think that's a, that was sort of one of those points that sort of stood out. Um, and one of the other big things that we noticed was that people were using the iPad for content consumption, right? Um, we expected this, right? And we looked at the apps that people used, and people use Netflix, people use Epicurious, people use all these things. But they're generally, you sit there and you consume stuff off the, uh, the tablet. And people would often put content creation aside for later. So like, you know, you get your emails, you'd go through, you delete some of them. You might reply to a couple of them that were really short, you know, a couple of words. You might say, yeah, I'll see you Thursday. But generally, for anything more substantial, um, people did not use the tablet for creating anything, for creating email, for creating things like that. Um, there's a few edge cases that I'm going to talk about later because I think they're important. Yeah? Do you think this is somehow related to the shared ownership concept also? Because if you're creating something on, if, if I'm writing in my notebook, then I'm less likely to share it with uh, my cousin. Whereas if I'm just reading a book, then I'm quite okay with giving it to my cousin. Right. It's an interesting question. Um, what I think that's part of it. My guess is that the biggest problem is how slow it is to type on a on a screen. That people are happy sharing the iPad because they're not creating anything on it. Because they're not creating anything. Oh, so the causality is yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. They're happy to share it because they're oh, not creating. Or because they don't use it that often. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Once every two weeks. If you got to pull it out from under, another book. from under the magazines, who cares? That's right. <laughs> I mean, that, I think all of these are reasonable hypotheses, right? Um, That's one of the obvious reasons for sharing, which is on the thing about kids. I mean, having like grandsons who are, you know, put a, a keyboard, a laptop in front of them, and they bang on it, and that's it. You don't have them, they're off. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and I don't know about your grandson, well, I do know about your grandson, but, I'm, but uh, I know that my children's ability to make a laptop computer do things that you never thought were possible by banging on the keyboard. There's commands in Skype, there's like keyboard commands in Skype that I never knew existed that, that apparently make the computer blow up because like, um, so I think this is an interesting, and we're going to come back to this one at some length about what's going on here and what's going on with the um, content consumption. Yeah. Uh, was this research done before Siri or after Siri? <laughs> this was done before Siri. Okay. Um, Siri. I'll come back in a couple of years and tell you about <laughs> what's going on with voice stuff. Um, but, it's, but this was before Siri. Um, I'm not sure, and I don't know whether Siri has impacted how people. But the reason I ask is because I, I noticed a lot of people recently don't like to type, but they'll use voice text transcription, then that's it. So it removes that barrier entirely. Or mostly? Mostly, I think, is the answer. I mean, uh, ha having 
voice to text. So, so well, the preliminary stuff I've seen with Siri is that people use Siri is great when you're driving and you want to say, you want to sort of you know you're like oh bring up the map for this particular address or something like that. And the examples and this is based on me asking on Facebook about three weeks ago. Hey, does anybody use Siri? And these are the stories that I got back. Um, whether people are going to start using that more for voice input, um, it'll be interesting to see. Um, but we'll find out. Some people really liked this idea, this, the distinction between a tablet and a, um, and a laptop. So I mean, if you look at things like the Microsoft Surface, which has come out in the last uh, couple of months, um, which is a tablet with a keyboard attached, right? And when we were suggesting those sort of concepts as sort of a relatively obvious probe to ask about, some people hate him. This guy, Caleb, was like, I think putting a physical keyboard on an iPad is a terrible idea. It defeats the point. It's a totally new device. People who do that want it to be a computer because they know what a computer is. iPads are different. They're, they're not computers. They're something different. I think we're still trying to figure out what makes them different. That's, that's part of the fun. I try not to read quotes off slides, but that one amuses me, so <laughs> you all have to put up with it. But I think... Which bit? Well, I, often if you ask people to speculate about future technologies, the story that they tell you bears little resemblance to what they'll ultimately do if you make that technology. Like, for example, many people say, I would use Siri all the time, and yet few use yep. it very much. Yep. I think, I actually think keyboards on tablets can be really, really powerful. Um, I think. I think it's important to recognize that things like Microsoft Surface are a great first draft in that space, but they are not quite the sort of the full, there's a lot of possibilities that we haven't explored, right? Just as a very simple edge case, if we go back to our typing on the couch issue, right? The, the way that the surface works, typing on the couch doesn't work very well. Um, and you can think of other ways that you could do that and other ways you can fi configure that that could be much better for that. So I actually think keyboards are interesting but then again, I'm a very text-heavy person. I read a lot, I write a lot. Um, my primary form of intellectual output is in the form of papers, same as many people in this room. Um, it's not clear that I'm, the, that I'm the important part of this, that I'm, you know, I'm the kind of person for whom this matters, right? Um, one of my favorite, this is a direct quote. Um, one of my favorite experiences was talking to people about the apps that they used and we got people to give us a tour of their, of their iPad. Um, and that was a sort of lovely procedure to do, to sort of sit down and just get people to sort of walk through things. Um, and one of the things that people told us was that the marketplace sucks. And we, we heard that over and over again. It was very hard to find the things that people were looking for. Um, my favorite example uh, was that um, somebody, some, one of these guys, who was quite technology savvy, um, uh, Jordan, I think we're calling him. Um, and Jordan, I remember Jordan saying his theory was that Apple had made it so bad on purpose so that other people would come up with better algorithms um, so that you could get an app that would be a better interface to the store. Um, I said this to some people at Apple the other day just to watch them splutter. Um, it, was, it was kind of fun. So what, what do people use, right? Um, Netflix is the killer app, right? Everybody uses Netflix. Um, and we saw a couple of interesting combinations. So Netflix was a great thing for, to use while you were doing something else. You're doing the laundry, you've got the iPad there. You're cooking dinner, you've got iPad there. Um, we saw interesting things like people watching iPad on the big screen, watching, sorry, Netflix on the big screen, and then they'd have IMDB or something open on the tablet on their lap. So you're like, oh, wasn't she in Buffy for a while? And you know, sort of doing that IMDB ecosystem thing. Um, and I think right now, there are a very few number of examples I can point to about cross-screen interactions where you've got something on the big screen and stuff on the small screen. I can assure you that everyone's very excited by them and thinks they would be a good idea were anyone to get around to doing anything decent about them. Um, Heineken has one for watching football matches. Uh, I've seen one or two other ones. We didn't see anyone who actually used any of these apps. And admittedly, this was 18 months ago, so maybe things have sort of been updated since then. Yeah. With the um, DSI, yeah, is it? The, the Wii U. The Wii U, sorry. Um, has anyone used one? Hmm. Not for, oh, one! Is it cool? Yes, I like it. Is it like totally awesome? I think it's pretty cool. I don't really have any games for it. Because there's not a lot of that. Yeah, yeah. 
But I mean, I, as I understand it, it I mean, I, I seem to remember Nintendo did something like this before, where you could have, where there was a there was an in-screen interaction. Was that Nintendo? Dreamcast. 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 Mm. Well, good ideas come back. You know, I'm sure Bill Buxton invented it in 1983. And, you know, <laughs> these things keep coming back. Um, Epicurious is fabulous. As, as, um, as Scott mentioned, I've had a long interest in the kitchen and computers in the kitchen. Um, and I'm very fond of putting you know, nice ads from Honeywell from 1967 with kitchen computers in my talks. Um, Epicurious is nice because it just does one thing and it does it really well, um, which is when you need to know what to cook, there it is. Um, this is one of the few things that I changed my own practices based on my research, in that I went out and I talked to people, and all the people we interviewed were using Epicurious, and so now I use it in, when I'm cooking things. Um, and uh, that's nice, right? I mean, and it seems to work, and it's kind of nifty. Um, FaceTime. Uh, FaceTime, people really like FaceTime when it's Apple end-to-end. -end. Um, if, if you know that your grandparents have a Mac, and you know that you've got a Mac with the kids, then people really like FaceTime. Um, some of you might be familiar with a lot of work that I did on how much Skype sucks. Um, and Skype does over, it's a little more detailed than that, but um, face, FaceTime is a little more detailed, is a little more reliable. Um, people like the form factor, the full screen. Um, there was some, and there's not a keyboard sitting out there for your kids to wham on and then make Skype do things that you never knew were possible. Um, and Dropbox is interesting. Um, Dropbox is particularly interesting because there's no good way to move file systems, files on and off the iPad, right? Um, everybody talked about this as a limitation. And I think that there, are, there is a whole other talk about why Apple made those decisions and what those imply for computing. Um, but people found, we kept hearing these stories about Dropbox as a way that people would get their stuff available to them. We also saw some really horrible hacks because there, were, there weren't good file systems. One of my favorites was one of the people we interviewed played guitar in a church on Sundays. Like he was in his church uh, band. Um, he would use the, the web browser to go to sort of pieces of sheet music on the web or, or tab on the web. Um, he'd then take a screenshot of the tab, and then it would get saved to the photos. And then he would use the, the screenshot in, through, through iPhoto to, play, to, to be able to play the music. And which is a horrible, horrible hack. <laughs> but it's a really interesting hack. But it does point to certain limitations there. All right. Um, and this ties into uh, a bigger question, right, which is about this role of the iPad and about the role of the iPad in sort of working with other devices. Um, Dropbox is a great example of something that works really well uh, across multiple devices. I think IMAP is another great example that we sort of forget about. Because IMAP works, right? You check your email from one device, you go into work and use your other work device. You don't think about the fact that it's, that it's, not work, that it's, um, that it's worked as well as it has. Um, as a nice example, think about address book syncing, right? Like whether you reply to someone on one machine and, it, and the email address goes to the right place on the other machine. Address book syncing still sucks. It still breaks regularly, and yet we get our email right. So yay for things that actually do work. Um, this is a whine that says, these are people whining and saying what I just said. All right, now let's, now that gives you an idea of some of the data that we gathered and some of the stories that came out of that. And now I want to sort of extrapolate and push this forward um, and start making some stuff up or drawing conclusions as, as it's more nicely known. And I want to go back to these three themes of comfortable computing, communal computing, and this third, third question of creation. So, Let's go back to this thing that people sit comfortably when they're using an iPad. Have any of you read Lucy Suchman's um, Human and Machines Reconfigurations? A few. Um, so what she basically did was take Plans and Situated Actions, which was an earlier book, and then sort of wrapped a couple of chapters around it saying, oh, this is what I was really talking about. Um, and I'm not sure I agree with her that this was what she was talking about. Um, I should emphasize, I think both these books are great books, right? Um, but what she talks about is the role of the body in computing and the role of computing in reconfiguring the body and how those two go back and forth. And if you don't want to read the whole book, there's a really good article in Interactions this summer, uh, I think it was the May-June issue, by Peter Wright, in which he manages, it's, it's the best article about bodies and computing actually since your review article from 
Dis 2008, I think, in which he says, look, this is everything you need to know in this book. Um, but you know, ideally, you'd read the book. But she talks about this way in which bodies reconfigure the user, and the user reconfigures the computer, and so on. And the tablet means that the user uses it in a comfy place. We kept hearing people saying, oh, well, I curled up with my iPad and I. Or we hear people say things like, well, um, it's kind of like my blankie, was one of the phrases that one of the informants used. And if people talk about, well, I go, you know, I go from the couch to my bedroom, and, and I'll take my blankie with me in the form of the iPad. And OK, fine. You know, nothing exciting here. Um, but then there's this interesting thing that it gets used for these sort of comfortable uses. And people are using it for this sort of social grooming, for, for checking in with friends on Facebook, for doing little things with Twitter. And that's interesting, right? Now, one way to do this is say, well, it's just the affordances, right? It's just the form factors. It's crappy for doing other things. Therefore, people don't do other things. But I think there's something more fundamental here um, about the role of the body and the ways in which what your body can do and the ways that the affordances of the tablet suggest certain things that are the right things to do with it. And I think that's kind of interesting. Um, one of the things that we realized in, in writing this was that we were looking, we were writing this in, in, an, in an office, same as, as you might expect. And we realized that the, the office furniture spoke to a set of assumptions about what kind of technology was in there. So the, there was a certain depth to the desk. And in particular, the corner was sort of had extra space. So you could put your big monitor in the corner of the desk. Um, you're like, all right, that's kind of interesting. And, and we started to think as a thought experiment, what would happen if you know, we go, went and sat down with the folks at Steelcase and said, all right, that's what computing looked like in the 80s and in the 90s. Um, what, what, would, what would be different if we had different kinds of computing? And how would that change the physical space? Right? What would it mean if you, when you went to work for a company, instead of giving you a laptop, they gave you a tablet? Right? How would that change what your experiences were with the technology? So that's the thing about comfortable computing. And this is something where I would love to hear your expert advice on this, because I think it's an interesting question. And I think this ties into a set of work that I've seen about the role in computing, uh, the role of the body in computing, I'm sorry. Um, and yet it's one of these things where I'm not sure where to take this next. Is this just something where I throw it out there, or is, or, or is there, are there some place we can move this forward? So that's the first thing that I think is sort of interesting out of this stuff. The second thing is I want to talk about this role of communal computing. Um, now, there's a lot of work that's been done on having multiple devices. So I'm thinking about the stuff that AJ Brush and some of her team did up at Stanford, uh, sorry, did up at uh, Redmond, at, at Microsoft Research, on family accounts on computers. Because this, this question of how you manage multiple people using a single device is one that comes up again and again and again. Um, and thinking about things like, what are the right levels of passwords? Earlier on, we were talking about things that people want to keep private. Uh, this is in the context of discussion about finance and income and things like that. And so people want to, you know, generally people don't want to share what their financial state is like. You might share specific things like, oh, well, I'm thinking about investing in, in solar energy stocks, right? And people have that discussion. But there's a limit to how much financial information people want to share. People care about their medical records, right? People might be willing to say, oh, well, I have this particular problem. I hurt my leg or something. But people are often a little cagey about their, their medical information. And then there's porn, sex and porn, right? Like it's, it's this ubiquitous thing that we don't talk about. We don't talk about a lot um, in HCI and arguably, well, except for me, arguably we, we should talk more about it. But this is sort of another thing that gets used in sort of thinking about these private areas within computing. Think about the right way to handle that. And the flip side of this is saying, well, it would actually be very convenient to be able to walk up to a computer and say, oh, here's a computer. I want to use a web browser, right? What are the sort of lowest levels that you can make accessible to people and that you maybe should make accessible to people? Um, so this ties into this, this question of families using devices. Um, everyone has seen these systems that various people have built over time where you have, you have a tablet computer on a fridge, right? I did this. I'm sorry. I'd like to apologize in public. Um, but when, one of the things that happens when you put a tablet computer on a fridge is people try and replicate the functionality that fridge spaces had before. Um, fridges are very good for organizing families, right? Um, Alex Taylor and Laurel Swan at Microsoft Research Cambridge have done some fabulous, fabulous stuff on this. <coughs> but one of the problems is that when you get engineers to design this thing, they say, well, all right, um, we're going to have this system. We're just going to have a very simple. Uh, four-digit PIN number that people can use to put it in. 
to, to, to gain access to the system. And then we'll have a different one for the parents to use so they have higher levels of social of, of access. And you're like, well, but this isn't actually what the, the problem, right? Like this is not generally, you know, if you go over to someone's house and they have a calendar up on the up on the um, fridge, you don't go and write stuff in, you know. You don't add stuff to their, sh well, I do actually add stuff to people's shopping lists now. But I try and add stuff that's ridiculous enough that it's pretty clear they shouldn't actually buy it. You know, barrel of monkeys kind of thing. Um, but it's precisely because it's a social transgression that it becomes an interesting thing to do at parties. It's my excuse, anyway. But thinking about the social structures around sharing information, because generally families want to know what, you know, want, don't want to have barriers between um, barriers to actually using devices, right? Um, if you've got younger kids, you, do, you may actually want to know what your, what your kids are doing, and you may well want to be reading their email. Um, but thinking about the ways in which this question of multiple people using single devices, it's a nice way to sort of push these, these ideas forward. And the second thing that I want to talk about in that context is this idea of single users do not have single identities. Um, and this is sort of an ongoing fight that I feel like we're having as a society right now. It's not at all clear to me that everyone should uh, have a single identity they use for everything. So I want to do a poll because I, you're a nice sample audience for this. How many of you have a Facebook account? All right, put your hands down. How many of you have more than one Facebook account? Including ones you use for joke purposes, that's less than I thought. I'm, I'm, I'm a little disappointed with my own, my own project Um So the, the studies that I've seen, and particularly if you look at younger crowds, people have multiple accounts. Um, I have three. I have my own one. Um, I have a character I invented purely for playing Farmville called Joe Farmer. Um, and then I have a French a Quebecois DJ called DJ Jean-Claude Rock. Um, I must admit I haven't used for a while, but was pretty fun while I, while I did. Um, here's a list of websites that I came up with that people um, have to have some login for or may value some login. Um, and you can see that these different websites, you may have very good reasons why you don't want your identities being crossed, being on all of these. If you're writing fan fiction, um, if you're checking into places all the time, um, if you're a heavy frequent flyer, um, if you're trying to save money, if you're putting up photos, um, FetLife is a fabulous example. FetLife is a uh, social network for people interested in sex, basically. Um, it's, it's reasonably large, it's heavily trafficked, lots of people use it. And it's a perfect example where people want to have a different identity on FetLife than they do, that is not linkable to their professional lives. Um, and I think there's a lot of questions here about this role of multiple identities and how you can tie this, this people having multiple identities into this question of multiple people using single devices. Um, yeah, Michael. This is more or less of a problem than it was back a few years ago when there was single computer per family. It was just as communal. Um, I think it's related, obviously. Um, I think the ways in which it has become a problem have changed somewhat. Um, one of the things that in, in that single computer per, per, per family story is that you don't have as much of this notion of identity on the internet, right? And you were those problems. You know, there were people posting on Usenet, no doubt, and saying, oh, well, I'm posting on Usenet and in, you know, whatever, alt.model airplanes, but my son keeps posting in alt.transformers and... But, you know, it's not like these are, these are totally new problems. But I think the, facil the very easy way in which we can sit, you know, you can all be sitting there in front of the television and pass a tablet around between you makes these come to the forefront more. So I, it's not that I think it's a fundamentally different question. Um, I would probably say it's probably more of a problem than it was. But I think it's very much related. And if you, I mean, even if you go back to sort of the early stuff on this, like Venkatesh 1996, there's an article in the, in the ACM talking about what people do with computers in the home, in the communication of the ACM. Um, and he talks about this as being one of the issues that comes up. Um, but it's remarkable that we haven't solved it, right? <laughs> that it's still an issue that we're talking about. So I want to talk about my third thing here, which is this idea of models of creation, right? So here's the easy thing. And this is, I kind of think of this with all due respect to my various colleagues. 
um, as being, this is the Apple story, right? Tablets are for consuming media, right? You can go onto, onto iTunes and you can download the best content in the world. You can look at great videos. Um, you can play some games that other people have written. Um, if you, get, if you get a computer, like a real computer, not like a tablet computer, but like a real computer, then you too could write stuff for tablets. But tablets are devices for consumption. And you can see that that's sort of a, a place that we could go and say, okay, that's fine. That's, that's what happens, right? But I think, and this is kind of a political thing more than anything else. I think I believe in some political and, or moralistic way that there is something right about computers being used for for, cons for creation and not just for consumption. Um, and I come from a reasonably long line, I think there's a reasonably long line of people uh, going back to computer lib I'm thinking of, right? Saying, you know, there is actually sort of a moral question here. Um, and so what's the kind of creation that we are seeing with a tablet, right? And that's, the, that's what I want to go into. Um, some of what we're seeing is curation, and that's what I want to spend a bunch of time on. Um, and some of it is, is a simple change that we're no longer talking about text, but we're talking about video. So here's a video I'd like to show you. Let's see if this works. Maybe. This was created by Jim. Jim is a high school teacher in London. Um, and he created this on his lunch hour um, literally on his lunch, lunch hour, uh, using an iPad 2, right? So he's doing a little bit of stop motion animation, he's putting some stuff together, um, uh, he's putting some music in there, there's a little bit of background stuff. Lovely. That's Jim, he pretty much looks like that. So, that's kind of interesting, right? That's a kind of creation that, that is, that was made entirely on an iPad, that was made entirely on a tablet. And, okay, to some degree that's anomaly. But there's some other things that we're starting to see. And a lot of it starts to look like this, that you can't see. No? Uh, I think this is, sorry. Now you've got my display. Try that again. Lovely. And that's the role of curation and mashup in creating new stuff. Um, here we have a picture, and then someone has added a caption to it, right? Creating a new object. Um, 4chan spends an awful lot of time doing things precisely like this, right? Um, whether it's people taking some. Uh, existing meme, whether it's creating new memes, this idea that you can create new things by jamming stuff together is something that's been very popular for like the 20th, throughout the 20th century, right? You can go back to, to John Hartfield um, in the first half of the 20th century. You can go around to all these people doing collage, right? And this way in which this, this process of ongoing, uh, taking existing things, changing them, adding commentary to them, working with them, juxtaposing different things, um, selecting certain things to put next to other things, um, recirculating back in, I think is a powerful form of creation. And I think it's easy to dismiss it because, you know, the highest form of the art is a duck shouting at people, right? Um, and yet there's something interesting here. It's like dismissing um, rap music because they don't, use, they don't play guitars. They're just using um, records and they're just using samples. They're not actually musicians, therefore, right? And I think there's something that's more interesting that's going on here. Um, Twitter, I think, is another nice example here. Lots of people use Twitter and they say things on Twitter. An awful lot of people are using Twitter in this curatorial way in which they get a whole bunch of stuff in and when they see something interesting, they retweet it out to their followers, possibly with this kind of commentary, right? And that's the kind of function that is enabled on a tablet. It's not obviously only happening on tablets, but it's enabled on a tablet. Um, Pinterest is another nice example, right? Uh, have anybody, has anybody used Sokol yet? Social, sorry, social. And you don't even work for Microsoft. Or were, were you working for Microsoft when you used it? I did at the time. You did at the time. <laughs> has anyone else? It's a Microsoft social network. It basically enables you to doing, it lets you do sort of Pinterest collages very easily. Um, and 
very much in this vein. So what's this process look like, right? And there's a, we, we gathered a whole bunch of examples of this, um, and they all end up fitting into roughly this, this system, right? You collect a whole bunch of stuff together, you curate it, right? You pick the stuff that you think is important and you discard the stuff that's not important. You collage things together, right? You're creating new things by combining things that you keep. You comment on it, and that may be part of the, of, of the, of the collage process, right? I mean, you can definitely read the, the, the duck shouting as being part of the sort of combining these two in this juxtaposition. And then you recirculate it, right? It comes circulated back out to the, to the networks that you saw this stuff come in. And this, again, this ties into this sort of very 20th century tradition about reappropriation re and pulling stuff together. And I think this is a place that I'm seeing work in, I'm seeing this kind of creation happening in tablets. So I want to be careful about that because obviously this is not all happening on tablets, right? This is not only happening on tablets. Um, and I'm not saying that everything that you see on Pinterest and Twitter and 4chan or whatever is created on tablets, far from it, right? But there's something interesting that's going on here, right, about what the affordances are. Um, there's something lovely about sorting photos um, when, you can, when you can drag them around on a screen. There's a reason that, that, that every uh, touch interaction video, well, for as long as Bill Buxton has been doing them, um, involves people rotating photographs and then making them bigger. Right? It's a very nice thing to be able to do that sort of sort, that sort of video work, that sort of photograph work. Um, it's a nice interface for it. So I retain a certain degree of cynicism around this particular set of conclusions, but I do think it's kind of interesting. So I want to wrap up, and I've deliberately tried to keep this short because I'd like to have um, a discussion with, with all of you about these particular areas. Um, I think ta thinking of tablets as, as a tool to think through the future of computing gets really interesting, right? Um, and I think there are three particular areas that, that, that point directions for the future that I think are worth spending some time thinking about. First is this idea of comfortable computing, right? Taking the actions of the body seriously and the ways that people's bodies are configured changes the, the things that they do online and things that the, the changes the things that they do with the computer. The second is this role of, co of communal computing, right? And thinking really about what it means to have multiple identities on any given device and multiple identities uh, for a, single, for a single people and for multiple people using device. And third, this new kinds of creation, right? If we are seeing more and more tablets, if we are going away for, from the standard thing for the last 120 years, has been when it's time to create something, you sit down at a keyboard, right? And this is what Mark Twain did. Like 120 years ago, I was like, all right, I'm gonna write this thing um, called Huckleberry Finn. So he sat down in front of the keyboard of his Remington and he wrote a book on it, right? And 120 years, when we've wanted to create things, people have sat down and done that. Obviously, there have been other ways to create, but it has been an absolutely dominant form of creation in our world for, the, for quite some time. And what happens if the, the dominant computing devices, the dominant tools that are around, no longer have keyboards, right? And that gets very interesting. And I think it suggests that there may be, we may be finally seeing these things that people like Bill Mitchell have predicted for a while, um, books like the, the Rise of the Image and the Fall of the Word. Um, are we going to see this, this thing that, that we do so well, which is write some papers um, and get them published and other people read them and then they write some other papers? Is that going to go away? Probably not. But are there ways in which that's going to change and ways in which the dominant modes of creation? So I think these are interesting questions. I don't know the answers. Thank you very much for listening. Yeah. About the last point about two kinds of creation, I wonder if the question is actually too narrow. I mean, people may not be looking at iPads as a dichotomy of creation or consumption. It could be that they're using it for entirely new things, like communicating with other people, right? So when I think of iPad, uh, it seems like more and more, it's, it's at least during the Apple ads, it seems like it's a FaceTime device rather than, you know, a creation or communication, uh, consumption device. So. I wonder, just you know, dichotomizing it is too narrow. I think that absolutely. Dichotomizing it is obviously too narrow. However, if there are limitations on that communication that are happening because of the device, so if, for example, um, you write me a nice long newsy email about the stuff that you've been doing, and I look at my device and I'm like, oh well, I can't reply to this on on this tablet. I've got to go to some other device. Then I think you're going to have an impact based on those affordances. 
Sure. Uh, but maybe what you're going to have is me not sending you a newsy email, but instead having a basement conversation. Maybe. And I mean, uh, but then I would say that was precisely this discussion, right? About what the, what the forms are of the, t of, of the output. So, yes, is you know, the short version, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What about the role of voice, voice dictation, or voice commands? I think that the, the, the boat is done. There was someone asked earlier on about Siri and whether this was done pre or post Siri, and this was pre Siri. Um, and I think the answer is we don't know. Um, I, I feel like people have sat up in this place, in this room, for 20 years and said, well, the, really soon now we're going to have really good voice control for stuff, right? And. And I mean, and I think we're going to start to see those, and you're already seeing these edge cases, right? I mean, Dragon Dictate for people who, who have um, RSI, for example, is something that we've seen happening. Um, and yet, the functionality is still such that if you, if you have an alternative, and this may be just that our systems have not been developed well enough to really respond to this, typing is still better than dictating. I mean, I know every so often when, when, my, uh, when my wrists get particularly bad, and I go back to using the dictating. God, it's annoying. I mean, I'll, 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 I'll manage it for a, a review or two. For some reason, reviews are always the time in which my wrists break. Um, it's probably psychological. Um, but I, but it, it's frustrating, right? So yes, I'd love to believe that's going to happen. Um, one of the things I've done a couple of times when I think I was coaching, was it when you were teaching 147, I think? 247. 247. And I suggested to the group that I was doing this in a only slightly unethical way that instead of sending email for the next week, they should just try sending each other video. Um, and they didn't do it. <laughs> they didn't even come close to it. I'm yet to persuade anybody to do this. Um, if, if anyone wants to do an experiment, I'd love to, in which you, you and a small group commit to only communicating using audio and video. I mean, whether there's some transcription in there is another question. But uh, it's remarkably hard to, to, to do. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting when I think about my iPad usage, the thing I use it the most is neither consumption or creation. It's using it as like the shared interface for all the other devices. I use it to control the music in our house. I use it as a remote for the TV. Um, it was interesting to not see that come up, even yep. though that's really built in like an iTunes as like yep. a core Apple feature. So I actually think that's an artifact of the fact that we were, we were having these interviews 18 months ago, and people had not yet got to that stage of, of using it a lot. And I believe it didn't really work until iTunes 10, is that correct? Oh, is that true? <laughs> I, it's something like that. Um, I think there were one or two people who had talked about that, and that was a theme that came up. Um, one of the families, one of the people we talked to had, oh, I can't remember, done one of those things where he'd instrumented his whole house and so he could open his curtains from the bed <laughs> using the Mumble X10 Mumble. Um, but it basically didn't work. <laughs> and his wife hated it, like it was one of those stories. Um, <laughs> But I mean, I think those basic things, turning music off and on, sharing screens, that sort of question, um, I think we're going to see more and more of that. Um, they end up being relatively brief interactions, though. Um, I mean, I'm always a little nervous about ways of counting things that count duration, um, because a, a, as being sort of what people want to do, because on that basis, we would want to spend our time on hold on 800 numbers. Um, <laughs> And I mean, if you look at, if you do an analysis of how people use telephones, the longest duration is calling customer support. Um, that's how you have 45 minutes, an hour and a half long conversations. But those are not what we really like doing. That being said, if all you're doing is turning volume up and down a bit, or skipping over call me maybe because you heard it six times yesterday, there's a limit to how much that interaction that is. But I think a lot of that is just an artifact. That it's, that, that there's a space between data and writing and giving talks about it and things like that. We can do a follow-up. It'll be fun. Yeah. <laughs> Terry. So, so since you brought up the moralistic dimension, mm -hmm. I'm just curious how you react to criticism of that last point you have up there, which says that <clears throat> creation through collection, et cetera, et cetera, is inherently shallow as opposed to Mark Twain sitting at the typewriter and really thinking about a whole model. Yep. But it's bad societally for us to be going that direction. Yep. Um, I go back to the rap music thing, right? Um, I think there are... It's delicate because you find yourself defending lolcats really quickly, right? <laughs> and I think lolcats can be pretty funny. But uh, do I think that they sort of compared to Huck Finn? Probably not, right? Um, 
I think it's precisely because I care about that question that I want to ask this, right? Um, it's because I worry about devices that make a fundamental distinction between author and, and, and consumer, right? That say, this is a device for consumption. Um, you need to spend more money if you want to create things. And that worries me as a pattern, which is why I want to have that conversation. Um, I think there are devices, there are things that you can create through mashup, through reference, um, through collage that really can be very sophisticated pieces of, pieces of, um, of culture, right? Um, you look at the sort of things that people are doing with machinima and they, are, they may or may not be the greatest pieces of art that humankind has ever produced, but if you put them up next to whatever is you know, on Fox News tonight, on the Fox Channel tonight at 8 o'clock, they're pretty comparative pieces of creation, right? So I'm not sure I agree that what's produced is necessarily as bad. Obviously, if a lot of stuff is produced, you, you know, you're going to have a power law, right? Um, a lot of it is not going to be very good. But I think there is absolutely the potential for really good stuff, and there are particular examples we can point to with things that I think have been successful. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Michael. Maybe this is a threshold kind of argument where you're actually getting people to create who wouldn't have before. Uh, the, the bar is long enough to, to riff on some, some image macro uh, or to comment on someone's Facebook post that you're, you're getting creation out of people who would not otherwise create. Sure, it's not brilliant, but maybe you can <laughs> yeah, and I think I mean I think your work with 4chan is a really nice sort of example of looking at that process that people. So maybe you start off by <coughs> commenting lol on someone else's lol cat, and then from there you say, well, okay, um, now I'm going to create my my own lol cat using this existing Im image macro, and now I'm going to upload a photo that I think would make a good one, and now I'm going to edit the photo so that it looks like a particular set of things. And I think there's a path to creation. Um, and we need to be reasonably agnostic about this and, 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 and say, well, okay, the more ways that we can have these opportunities for creation is probably a good thing for society. Um, at the same time, I don't claim... I, I think this is weak, this is weak signals, right? Um, but I think it's weak signals that I'm seeing in a lot of different places. Um, I remember at some point looking at things like... Um, oh, it was the, uh, All the Single Ladies. Is that song called All the Single Ladies? Single ladies, maybe? I'll look at Terry, because he clearly knows me. <laughs> uh, huge Rihanna fan, huge. Um, Beyonce. 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 Not so good, not so good. Um, anyway, if you go and look for single ladies on uh, YouTube, there are in the millions of people who are doing their, who had done their own versions of the dance and uploaded them. And they are dancing, you know, in the same way that, you know, when you were a kid, you know, you sort of went up in front of the mirror with a hairbrush and, you know, sang, I don't know, Bon Jovi? Beyonce. Beyonce. <laughs> you know, Beyonce. It's true. You're a young man. Frank Sinatra. <laughs> Frank Sinatra, yes. <laughs> and now, you know, and yeah, okay, maybe that stuff now ends up on YouTube, right? And, and I think that's kind of an interesting uh, phenomenon. And one that kind of gives me a bit of hope, right? Like, you know, yes, here's, here's some, you know, relatively mass-produced piece of song, but here's 35 million, 999 people who, who care about this enough to go and do their own version and put that up there. And, you know, when you see three-year-olds dancing to, to, to single ladies and they're really enjoying it and they're, like, enjoying the, the sensation of moving their bodies and the music, you're like, that's great, right? So I think there is something here, and I think getting away from these notions of what constitutes sort of, you know, the right to create um, and, and democratization, that gets really interesting. Yeah, in fact. I think there's also a bias in, you know, that these are all verbal media, right? Writing, writing and uh, texting and all that's verbal and sort of biases away from people that are strong in visual media mm -hmm. or in manipulating visual language. And so you look, you look at everything from the <coughs> verbal lens of, you know, how verbally attractiveness, but then those visual people will kind of, they'll be off at the end. Yep. But, you know, these other media, you know, these other ways of creating, actually, let them, you know, be part of the conversation. Because mm -hmm. they're putting the visual stuff together. Absolutely. And I know, I, I know that's um, something I find personally very hard. Um, I hate video. I hate watching video. I find it, it takes so long. 
Um, as mentioned, you know, I found a way that I could watch YouTube videos twice as fast so it didn't take as long. Um, I, I really don't like video at all, but I can appreciate that there's something here for other people, right? Um, I love, one of the reasons I like reading is because I can do it very, very fast. I can skim things very, very quickly. Um, whether we'll have more opportunities for sort of crossover. I mean, one of the lessons I learned at Nokia was that when I needed, when I, when I found something out, I needed to tell the story in three different ways. I would, I would write a paper about it, because that was how I understood it. Um, I would make a PowerPoint deck, which had slides which looked like other Nokia slides so that people could steal the slides and use them in their deck. And ideally, I'd make a short video as well that would go on sort of the internal YouTube um, for sharing so that people who liked video would then watch it. But there was this realization that you needed to put information out in all three of these forms, depending on who was going to listen to it. Rio. Um, I wanted to perhaps get your opinion on the sense that what ties all of these three things specifically for the, the iPad is it's, it's a very shallow level of commitment in addition to a shallow level of c creation. If I lose my iPad, and this may be just my own case, but if I lose my iPad, there's not much on it that I would feel at having lost. Whereas if I lost my laptop, I would just be, like, a lot of data would be gone. Um, and do, do you see... Back up more. Hmm? <laughs> back up more. I go on. Back up. But um, do you see, the you know, this future sort of creation model being a lot more deeper in that, in, in which case sort of this communal computing is going to be more critical because if I look at my iPad and, and I say, here is my iPad, what would I want you to not see? It would probably be just Facebook and email. Um, the rest would be for communal consumption. I wonder that if there's not two things that are going on here at sort of orthogonal levels. And one is this question of losing information, right? Um, and one of the stories that I'm hearing increasingly about things like Dropbox, things like Dropbox, things like IMAP again, um, presumably iCloud, um, even things like Gmail, right? Is the idea that you I mean, the whole Chromebook is based on the theory that you can't lose stuff, right? Um, if things are up in Google Docs, they're up in Google Docs, you get them from another computer. So I think that's a trend that I see happening more and more and more, right? The idea that you have single things on single devices that might die, I think will be going away. Um, one of the reasons that, that we're seeing such, if you go to any conference and you, someone mentions big data and they show you a graph that looks like this, Right? One of the reasons it looks like this, and okay, admittedly not like that, um, is because people are duplicating things. I know at Yahoo, we, basically everything is copied three times. Right, Like any given thing that's up on a server is on three different things. Um, and that's pretty standard across the industry. Lots of people do that. So I think there, there is a question about data, the data security, which I think is not really the, the important one that you're asking. I think the one that I think is more interesting is about this role of, of, of creation. Right and whether there are ways to do shallow and deeper kinds of creation um, that, that maintain that. And I wonder if that's really a distinction, right? I mean, if, if everything, if I, if I could very easily save my state in one place and go and pick up another computer, and when I walk up, it identifies me with RFID or creepy face recognition, and I start off exactly where I was watching single ladies' videos on YouTube <laughs> or whatever it was. I mean, I think... I, I think there's not an intrinsic link between those two. Um, I'm not convinced that, that, that there is any particular reason that you need to do only deep creation or only shallow creation on any particular device. Fair enough as an exploration. Two of you like rock, paper, scissors to see who goes first. Oh, one of them. <laughs> okay. So. <laughs> so, what I was wondering is so this. The study you did was like one iPad per household. Did anyone have more than one iPad? And Good question. How now. does that change things? How does that talk to you about start talking about like device, multi-device interactions and collaboration and stuff? That's a super good question. Um, I believe mostly they only had one iPad per household. I think there was one, there was at least one or two households, and I'd have to go back and check my notes to be sure. There was at least one household in which. They each had an iPad, but I think one of them left it at work and did stuff with it there. I mean, one of the things I haven't talked about in this talk a lot is about uh, sort of professional uses of iPads, because we did see some of those. Um, people who had bought styluses for their iPads, people who had um, uh, 
they were using them for checking people into clinics um, because they were sort of these devices very easy to, to, to hand out to people. So um, there were certain things we saw with multiple iPads. I don't think any of the homes that we talked to had multiple iPads um, lying around home. We can do another poll. My last poll failed miserably, so let's see. <laughs> how to, so hands up if you have hands up if you have an iPad. Personally or family? Family. Say so in your house, right? I would say like 75%, something like that. Hands up if you have another non-iPad tablet. Some, I would say. Um, I should point out that we actually went out looking for tablets, and what we found were iPads. Now that might be a little bit different, but back then that was very clearly the case. Um, and hands up if you have more than one iPad in your house. So a few, but not a great number. Not a great number. Um, and of course, you know, I saw some of the hands of your students where you have fairly independent people living in the same house. Yeah. Yeah. Then, is that, would you say that characterizes your experience that you've got one and your roommate has one? And... Me? Yeah. No, my partner and I both have one, but right. it's like, uh, there's definitely ownership over the idea. Definitely ownership. And, yeah. I mean, I don't actually own one. I, my wife owns one. <laughs> And uh, I get to use it if I'm good. Um, <laughs> well, then I have things, you know, I have a... You promise to cook. Well, exactly. <laughs> Except I've got, you know, it's got, got to get those recipes from somehow. Um, did you have a follow-up, or was that the... Yeah, so what sort of, like, device, device interactions, or do you think that has any kind of position of importance, or is yeah. everything just going to the cloud? So the only that? really good device-to-device device device thing we saw with the iPad was there's a Scrabble game that you can get where the Scrabble board is the iPad, and then you can use your iPhones, um, which is a lovely little concept, right? Um, the f turns out it's, I, I don't know, I'm not sure it was a smash hit, but it's a lovely idea. I mean, I want it to work, right? Um, and I think the Wii U is another nice example of, of, of thinking about these kind of, like, device-to-device -device interactions. Um, I think this is the thing that you're going to start to see a lot of work done on this. Um, I know folks at Samsung are working on this. Um, I know that people of Nokia have been talking about it. I know people at Yahoo are talking about it. Probably people at Microsoft are talking about it. Um, I think everyone's realized that this is sort of the obvious thing that's going to happen next. Um, I still haven't found a really good story about why. Um, there's got to be some, right? And I mean, I, you know, the, the Scrabble thing is nice because you have a reason to keep part of the display private and part of it public. You want a central place for hum for, for interaction. Um, but I'm still waiting. I'm still waiting for a really sort of compelling story that we can all be, we can all be like, yeah, don't you love playing multi-device interaction time? I don't know. All right, your turn. Yeah, uh, so moving a bit away from like content creation or consumption, what were your thoughts on like designing tablets on the role of tablets as like accessible devices? So like for example, like uh, a few a year or two back, I read an article where a blind person was using an iPhone, and the iPhone it had an app that would tell you like what color like it was pointing at, and that person. Had like revelations about and got like some sense of what color actually meant, right? Mm -hmm. And so, how do you think tablets could like help people, maybe blind people, even like the elderly? Then, yep. how would you design interactions for these people? So, again, that's one of those questions for which the answer is a whole talk. Um, I went and talked to uh, we have a guy called Alan Blackwell at Yahoo. Blackwell, what's his name? Brightman, Brightman thank you. Um, who does accessibility stuff at, at Yahoo. And we were talking about this particular issue. Um, iPhones, when they came out, were absolutely dreadful for blind people. Like, they were nearly completely unusable. And it was very clear that they were, Apple was basically going to get the ass sued off them um, for ADA reasons. And then they very quickly came out with a remarkably good interface for telling you what's under your finger right now that you're pointing to. Um, tablets, similarly kind of interesting. Um, they can be, there are, I think there are opportunities there. I'm not convinced totally by the, it's not clear to me that telling a blind person that what you're pointing at now is red is going to, it's not clear to me what that tells them. Like, like, 
What do they know? Now they know that red and there's red next to green. Okay? I guess it was more like, for example, like they like brought their phone out with them like at night or at sunrise and then they knew that when the sun was rising they would expect to hear these colors and it was more like they know a bit more about the surroundings rather than it's a useful app in itself. Mm. Interesting. Color through the camera. Yeah. I mean, spoken descriptions of what, 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 are, what is on photos, like blind photography is actually quite a big thing for blind people, like, like, and, it, and it's sort of becoming more and more um, prevalent. At the same time, I'm not convinced that there's a sort of fundamental difference with tablets that changes that. Do you think there is one? I, know, I guess that was just like an example of like how you might, uh, interesting way in which you might use like such devices. Yeah. And that because like touch devices and these tablets are basically like slates of glass and it's like highly visual and this seems to like be good for like most people but works for some good people. Yeah, no, it's a good question. I'll go and ask a blind guy, see what they say. But I, I, this is an area where I'm very conscious of my, of my lack of expertise. Um, at the same time, knowing certain interaction paradigms can actually make things much easier. When I was working on smart kitchens at the Media Lab with uh, Wendy Jew, in fact, she designed this very nice interface which was projected down onto a table and you could sort of touch different things. And this uh, uh, guy came by who was a professor at um, Louisiana State University uh, who was blind. And I remember talking about him with this device. I was like, well, you know, this is a very visual interface. This has got to suck for you. He said, ah, oh, but if I know that I can stand here, if I know that when I come to the corner and I find the corner and I can stand there, and then I have an interface in front of me, that's actually a really powerful point, right? To know that you have those kind of affordances that are built in. So he was actually far more of a fan of it than I thought he was going to be. Yes. So, uh, actually, no, wait, we've got someone over there who hasn't talked. Yeah, sure. Enough. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, so my favorite part about the movie Avatar, you know, all of it, people aside, was the guy's in a lab and he's got a desktop and it's got vital information. And he picks up his tablet and he puts his hand on the desktop screen and moves it over to his tablet and the whole display moves over. Like his entire session moves over. And I was like, that, that right there, that's what I want. Um, when that happens, like that has implications for the composing, consuming, like you're just moving your workflow. You move your workflow to your couch, you move your workflow to your car, you move your workflow to the train. And it also has um, communal computing, where instead of saying, look at this picture, you say, look at my workflow. Mm -hmm. Like maybe maybe more in, in work than in home. Do you see that as complementing this, or are there in, entirely new things that will happen once that technology Well, I mean, the, the one question is why you need to bother doing this, right? Right, right. right? Why you don't bring out the tablet <laughs> and say, Oh, here's what I was doing, right? Right. So, I mean, there is something to be said for, for explicit interactions at some point. Um, but I think, I mean, this goes back to this question of multiple identities, right? And the idea that things follow you around. And as mentioned, we're good at getting our files through Dropbox to follow us around, and we're good at getting our mail through IMAP to follow us around. Um, I've seen work presented at Kai Jacob Bodrum, Bodrum maybe? I think he had something at Kai 2009 about uh, a system that would be that would work like that for, for Windows, right? You'd log on, it would auto, you'd go up, and it would automatically save state in some reasonably smart kind of way. Um, where you could move stuff, the projectors, and mm -hmm. to your screen, move it, take a window from the screen, and, and then move, move, it, move it over. over. And yeah. yeah, there was Yang Lee at Google who did that. You take a picture of your. Uh, Laptop, say maps, and it transfers to your Android phone. So you that's can a horrible it. hack. That's <laughs> a horrible <laughs> hack. Why doesn't your phone just know already? Well, that, that's a Zero point. click interfaces in the future, right? <laughs> if I've been looking up some, if I've been looking up a, a map on my on my home computer, um, so I know that my colleagues Tim Son and some other folks did this at, at Nokia, where you you bring out your phone and it would automatically be synced Google with Google things like that. that. Yeah. Um, so the difference taking your photo if you want. That's well, no, the difference, the difference <laughs> yeah. is that I can take a photo of a web page on your computer. Yeah, okay, that's nice. And if you can then I mean it'd be nice to be able to do that with, with, with other things other than web pages, right? You know. Um, I have a very wrinkled Stanford map um, which tells me which I use I've been using for three or four years now. It has all these buildings that are missing because because 
they didn't exist three or four years ago. God, I wish I could have a decent map of, of, of that on my phone, and I still haven't found one, so I still cart around this little piece of paper. If anyone knows where I can get more, I should really do that at some point. All right. <laughs> wow. All right, any more questions? Quick question. Go so, for, it. Uh, for the communal computing thing, I, I really wonder whether what you're looking for is visibility rather than security. So, uh, I mean, if I get an iPad, just like you don't go and write appointments on somebody else's fridge, I'm not going to look at your email just because I got your iPad. Yep. So, I, I wonder if all you really need to design for there is just making private things less visible. Mm -hmm. rather than creating security mechanisms in order to ensure that that is the case. So I'm a huge fan of not having security mechanisms, that's for sure. And I wonder if it's not even a case of making it less visible, or more about making building devices that are aware, right? So even if you have Safari and you know that this is my set of tabs that I was using last time, right? And maybe that's on the page that's labeled, this is Joe Fisher's page, right? But when you turn on, you're, you're given a page that anyone can use, right? Click here and you can get your web browser, click here and get your email, right? There's no particular reason why that shouldn't be possible. Um, and being able to pick up a device, maybe you authenticate with your phone. People love authenticating with phones, right? I mean, everyone at Nokia believed that everyone wanted to authenticate with their phone. And I go like that. And then I can use my, my use the screen, I can use all the functionality there. Um, then when I go away, it's not left on there, right? Like if you actually sort of put your email on someone else's device, it's a, it's a hefty level of commitment. That's like, you do that way after you've moved in and shared toothbrushes, you know, like, <laughs> like that. I'm not sure quite I'm ready for that, right? But thinking about those sort of lightweight ways, but all of these boil back to this question of thinking about identity, right? And thinking about the right ways to transfer identity between different devices and play with different stuff. All right, I think Thank we you. should finish up.